Assalamu alaikum, I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. Now, I'm delighted to be joined today by Lord Helman Osley, the former chair of the Commission for Racial Equality and the current chair of Kick It Out. Um, Lord Osley, Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Islam Channel. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, now, your resignation last week as chair of Kick It Out was widely misreported, I understand, although you did offer to step down on certain key responsibilities. Now, I imagine, though, those decisions uh, must have been made after very serious consideration. Can you explain what were the key failures uh, which have been reported by the Football Association and the Premier and Football Leagues which led to such a big decision? And do you blame David Bernstein, the FA for chairman? Well, the first thing I would say is I'm not blaming anyone. Uh, I've talked about a collective failure of football to tackle some of the problems which are causing concern. Uh, I haven't resigned from Kick It Out and have no intentions of doing so. I've stepped down, I'm stepping down from an advisory group to the Football Association called the Race Equality Advisory Group, which I've chaired for the best part of four years. And I'm doing so uh, out of frustration as a consequence of things that the Football Association, in my view, haven't done which relate to matters during the past year. Uh, as a consequence of stepping down from that, I will relinquish my position on the council because that body elects someone to represent them on the council and I was elected and if I'm not on that body, I relinquish my position. And it does mean I automatically come off other committees that I serve on. The issues that I've been most concerned about are fundamentally what happened during the process of discipline with regards to the John Terry and Luis Suarez cases. How those processes were undermined by the clubs involved, Chelsea and Liverpool, by other players commenting, by managers commenting, uh, by England managers themselves commenting because John Terry was the captain of England and Capello and subsequently Roy Hodgson uh, both commented. And they all commented when they shouldn't have during a proper process that requires everyone to allow that process to flow. Now, by the Football Association not taking action against those who are seeking to undermine that process, it also undermined myself. In as much as I told people who were saying, well, you should be speaking out, we must trust the process. We must wait until the process is over. And a lot of black players lost confidence in the organisation. They felt you should have been speaking out, you didn't speak out. And of course, it came to a climax in October when over 30 uh, players refused to wear the T-shirts during the weeks of action. 4,000 professionals playing. It's only a small number, but a significant number. And they did so as a matter of principle because of their frustration. They felt their voices weren't heard. They were talking to their own union during the course of the past year about their concerns. Um, which was unrelated to my own concerns, but related in a different way because uh, they all have the same, we all share the same Are concerns. Are you saying that they had, their concerns were valid? Well, I think if anyone, anyone's got grievances, they have to be valid until they're heard and dealt with. And their, their concerns are obviously valid to them, that they would stick their heads out and say, defy their clubs and not wear the T-shirts. So, so essentially, I mean, in some ways, they're saying that the process that you asked them to have faith in had failed them. And you're sort of putting your hands up saying, actually, it failed them, but it's not your fault. It's the fault of the no, Premier Clubs. I don't think the process I'm relating to failed anyone because the Football Association carried out due consideration uh, of the cases involving Luis Suarez and John Terry, and they came to a proper conclusion. So they considered the process took a long time but the process didn't fail what people would want to see of proper consideration of the facts and a decision being made and if guilty, sanctions applied. What I'm concerned about is the undermining of the process where people were making comments and shouldn't have been and no one took any action against them. And we complied with the process, said nothing, and people felt we should have done what everyone else was doing. And we said, no, trust in the process. So what I'm saying is that my position has been totally undermined and I felt that the Football Association at the end of the process should have gone on record to say to everyone, this is what's happened, this is why it happened, this is what went wrong, this is how we intend to correct it, and we wish to apologise to those who uh, were victims during this process. Now, Anton Ferdinand and his family suffered considerably during that process. Even his club weren't supply, providing the same sort of support we were supplying. 
And throughout that process, we were continuing with our work and we were providing support to players who came to us and other people. So there isn't a situation in which we failed in any way. We were just undermined. And I think undermined unconsciously by people who were not exercising the same sort of responsibility. But what this all shows, and this is really why I've taken this move, is that football is not exercising moral responsibility in giving leadership, especially to the top, where everyone just puts a circle around anyone alleged to have committed an act of abuse and try to protect them in the way that our player is innocent, our player has done nothing wrong, we support our player, uh, instead of what we're now seeing as a consequence. Take, for instance, this weekend, David Moyes at Everton. Before the referee, referee didn't see anything, and before the, as the match is over, he said, my player behaviour was unacceptable and he has to face the consequences of the coming. That's the sort of responsibility. Now, we want people to put their hands up. We want people to get up to the, you know, stand up and be counted, to take responsibility for their actions, to not just assume that because this is our player, we will protect that player. Now, you, you've been at the, uh, if you like, the coalface, at the vanguard of uh, championing the cause of racial equality for most of your career as former chair of the Commission for Racial Equality and now in Kick It Out and other programmes that I know you've been involved in. Um, do you, as some people have suggested, believe that there's some concept of uh, institutional racism that exists here? That's, that is, I know you don't want to uh, say that there's any direct blame, but per perhaps collective blame. Do you think that, that there's an institutional uh, n nature to this problem? Well, I think with every institution in Britain and probably around the world, there is discrimination locked into its processes uh, because the status quo is what it is and people at the top and people who make decisions and people who are powerful and influential, uh, their whole approach doesn't enable uh, the organization's culture to just automatically change and deliver that radical change that provides the equality outcomes that people are looking for. And in the context of multiracial, multi-ethnic Britain, it requires a substantive mind ch mindset uh, change and culture change in organisations to achieve that equality outcome. And so the Football Association is no different. And in fact, in a lot of ways, it's much more entrenched in tradition. Uh, if you look at the makeup of the council, and this is not to suggest uh, anything other than fact, uh, it is 99.9% .9 white and male. Now, you talk about the makeup of the council. Uh, you've been lobbying to recruit more black and ethnic minority coaches and referees. Uh, how serious a discrepancy are we talking about then? I mean, I mean, what are the numbers? How, uh, how significant are the under-representation of black and ethnic minority members on club boards and the executives and so on? Well, boards, it's fairly non-existent. Uh, and the boards are a reflection of what I think a lot of big companies' boards reflect when it comes to ethnic minorities. Uh, it's almost a no-go area. So that's, that's one. Does it relate to the numbers of players? I mean, is it a, a reasonable uh, sort of echo of the numbers of players? Well, board, the, the, the makeup of a boardroom doesn't necessarily correlate with players because if you look at all boardrooms, there are very few former players who are in those boardrooms. It's about money and influence uh, and power. Um, in the managerial structure, the coaching structure, that, that's the one that more relates to former players, people who've got experience of the game, the technical aspect of it. Uh, and that is where we've, we've got a very small cohort of black coaches. We've got a lot of black and ethnic minority coaches at a lower level, in the amateur level, coaching non-professional league teams, youth teams, and so on. And we need to build that cohort up, uh, getting their badges and, and their, their qualifications to a higher level to, to produce a greater mass so it's to be able to compete. Set, is it? It, it, it is a lack of skill set at the level at which you then have adequate numbers to compete and be successful. But it starts from a presumption that, and a presumption over a long period of time, that black players wouldn't make good coaches, just as it, if you turn the clock back a little bit further, uh, black potential players uh, can't really make the grade in the way in which they're now shown they can make the grade and compete internationally uh, and competitively at that level. So it, there are stepping stones, and whilst one can look at the numbers and say there's great under-representation, uh, one's got to understand also how we move that forward, and we're beginning to do so, slowly but 
is going to have to increase rapidly. Tell us about the Rooney rule. I mean, I know that that's been an import that's sort of expected to arrive here from the United States. Um, and, and I know you've been talking about trying to implement something similar in the UK. Ha, has it worked there? And do you think it, it's a, a good way forward to try and get that implemented here? The Rooney rule is something that the Professional Footballers Association are pushing for. Um, and they're pushing for it on the basis that it would allow each club that's seeking to appoint a manager would consider at least one qualified black coach on their shortlist for interview. Now, once again, it's the presumption that there are enough to go around. If, say, there were six vacancies uh, to, to go around and they all required the, le the same level of qualification, uh, we may be struggling to get other than the same person on the same on every one shortlist. Uh, so it, it, the Rooney Rule has great advantages. Uh, however, I don't think you can simply just apply what's worked in the States to here, but what we can do and what we're doing, one scheme which has just been started and it's sponsored by the, uh, the Football Association, but it's got support from the managers, from the, from the PFA and others, it's a, it's a development program of bringing through uh, a number of coaches from BME backgrounds, not exclusively but predominantly, to enable us to start to build that cohort of qualified black and minority ethnic coaches who can then compete so you don't need to have the Rooney Rule imported you're growing your own to make sure that those who are making appointments providing you can get that process also to be a fair and open one to then compete with others uh, hopefully on a level playing field. While we still are mentioning the Rooney principle I mean your experience of it uh, was it one that saw some results based on merit or has it been in any way successful I don't know. It's been very successful in the United States uh, then they've, they've had this uh, legal jurisdiction where you can take positive and affirmative action, whereas our positive action, actually it's exactly in the way that I've described it in what we're trying to do now. You can help people to, qu to get to the level at which they can compete. You can't in any way give them any preferential treatment within the competitive process. So what we can do is offer training, which we're doing, and helping people to become qualified. Then they have to compete on, an, on a level playing field on an equal playing field now, but it's worked it's worked in America because they had a lot more qualified coaches who then had to be considered uh, by those clubs making appointments and because they had to do that very quickly people came through and they showed their quality so it was in the end it was all about merit because you're not going to appoint someone at stuff for your club so so in a sense they were a little bit ahead of us because they had a a, a pool of already people with skill sets that were appropriate. And they had a legal framework which made it possible to drive that on quickly. Now I understand that 20 Premier League clubs are scheduled to meet I think in the next day or two uh, to discuss proposals um, similar to the ones that you were talking about and that uh, they expect following more work they say that these clubs will be ready to start developing uh, a, a, an affirmative programme such as you were hinting at just. Um, obviously that pace is not fast enough for you. Well, no, no pace is ever fast enough to try and bring about equality outcomes and deal with people's grievances, which have lasted for a long time. And I also recognise at the same time, you can't do things too quickly, otherwise they fall over. You, you've got to ground them and you need to, to build them, but not too slowly. Uh, my, my only concern is that it takes a long time with all the backwards and, and, and forward and flow of consultations and people having their own different vested interests, that sometimes these things which start off as a blueprint for radical change become compromise and wishy-washy. I'm not in any way suggesting that's what it, what it is, uh, but that's my worry. I, I just think that if, you, if you're not able to say, we've got a problem a year ago, and these are the things we're going to do about it, and a year on you're still talking about it, then that suggests to me a problem. Yeah, I mean, you took a big step. I know it wasn't a resignation. Uh, obviously something wasn't right. Obviously the collection of issues that prevented proper action taking place in the last few months were not in place. Now, I want to ask you a direct question. Do you think there's the will to see this situation resolved? Do the clubs share your passion and the passion of those players who have been mistreated and abused to get this thing resolved and implement a new strategy here? I can only speak for the people who I'm in direct contact with and I will say clearly that I believe that the people are very committed. They genuinely want to see racism, if it can be, if not eradicated, 
certainly the effects of it minimized in football, dealing with abuses, dealing with unequal treatment, dealing with all forms of discrimination. So I, I, I'm convinced that, that there is a genuine commitment. What, how you translate that commitment into effective action, where there are still constraints about control and power, and where people will believe, I'm, I'm not racist, I, I believe in equality, but they don't necessarily do a great deal else to deal with inequalities that exist, and also uh, to deal with grievances that people hold, but also maintain the culture of protection from those who may be denying opportunity or continuing to abuse. And it requires a huge leap. And I think, I think people are prepared to inch their way there. Uh, and, and that's where we uh, diverge, because now, now, we you, can't inch our way to where we've got to get to. We've got to move fairly quick, quickly. Now, you've spoken about uh, what you see as a, a way of building the skill sets here from the grassroots upwards. And we've heard about various academies being established. But who's funding this? I mean, are there football association putting their money's, uh, money where their mouths are? Is the government being very supportive of building uh, the necessary institutions that will give the support mechanisms for, for new people to come through the system? I think it's quite important to stress that football is making a huge contribution to social cohesion in this country. You take the riots that took place in Tottenham a year ago, I would say, and, and spread across the whole country. If football wasn't investing as much as it was at a community level in doing community outreach work and many programs working with disadvantaged young people, that situation would have been a lot worse. So that point needs to be made. Football actually is a source for good. And the fact that it, we are highlighting some of the problems in football is about how do we tackle those problems. Football hasn't created racism. It hasn't created people who turn up to watch a game and some of them want to behave badly. They bring their racism, their prejudices, their nastiness with them. And sometimes we persuade them to park it at the gate and pick it up on the way out. Uh, but the reality is football is actually trying to tackle some of these problems. Now, football has to invest itself and is doing so to try and create the training and access opportunities to advancement. And it's not doing so with any financial help from government. Government's not, I mean, government obviously helps sport as a whole, of which football is a part. But football is making its own contribution. Not enough, but it's not relying on government. To do now, that. you would have thought this summer we had the Olympics here in Britain and our, our haul in medals, gold, silver and bronze was unprecedented. I mean, it's noticeable that many of the winners came from minority communities. Uh, do you think that that's helped to raise the profile and importance of Kick It Out's own programme and other similar programmes? And should our government be taking lessons from that? I think it's good that the profile was raised. People did uh, get a warm glow from the Olympics. The Olympics and the Paralympics offered an opportunity for people to feel that there was a greater coming together of the nation from all people from all backgrounds and I think it was a, a great re reflection of what Britain is today as a a diverse society with with many many cultures and interests uh, although uh, there seems to be some backsliding on that as people look at the census figures for yes, from 20, 2011 um, but I think we mustn't conflate uh, the Olympic feelings uh, that were generated as a one-off with very, a very quick return to the realities of life with high unemployment, a vast amount of homelessness, people sleeping on the streets, poverty increasing, uh, austerity still with us and now being predicted to go on longer than, than before, that whilst we can have that veneer and feel good about it and look at our television and see black and white and other people from different parts of the world competing and enjoying themselves without any nastiness. Uh, the reality is football brings people to, out who are suffering those afflictions and want to be nasty and want to be racist, sexist, misogynist, homophobic and, uh, and Islamophobic. And all these things we, are, we have to confront and try and deal with. And I think football, because it's a terrain where people want to come and play out their frustrations, we have to grapple with those, recognise they exist and try as best as we can to deal with them. But we need help. Society needs help to grapple with those. We can't just think that they will go away unless we do something about it. And we are trying in football. 
by challenging and confronting it, uh, we're hopefully making some difference. We want to make a greater difference. Now, you'll forgive me for asking this, I hope. Uh, we're in the time of Leveson, Leveson inquiries into abuse of the press. One component of that is the consistency of a sort of racism and Islamophobia that we regularly see. Um, but that, ra it, as an issue, raises two points. Um, to what degree you see our media playing a role in fueling, or rather doing not enough to challenge uh, the racism that clearly still exists in the sport. And, and the second issue that, that Leveson has brought up uh, is its similarities. Some have said that the Press Complaints Commission, for example, uh, has been a pointless and toothless body, mostly because it's been of its constitution, the way it was elected by the, uh, the, the association, the, the press bodies itself. They've said the same could be applied to kick it out in the way that it's constituted. Do you accept there's any parallel? And so I've asked you two questions in one. Well, I, I wouldn't want to make a, <laughs> a comparison of kick it out with the Press Complaints Association because the Press Complaints Association uh, actually uh, is a body set up by the press to regulate the press. Uh, kick it out was set up independently as a campaigning body to campaign for change. We have no regulatory aspect to our functions. Uh, we can push things through to be considered by the regulatory body, but we, we're not part, of, we're, we're not a regulatory body. So I think the comparison is, is not a good one. I, with regards to the, the press, I think it, it is a double-edged sword. You look to the press to highlight some of the wrongs in our society, and they do. Uh, every day, I think the press is looking for a story about more racism and abuse in football. So there's a flow of negativity. On the one hand, that helps you because it highlights some of the things that we're campaigning on. On the other hand, it suggests everything is bad with football. And so you, you, you've got to tough that one out um, because you do want these issues to be raised publicly so that people know they're going on. But you don't want people to be feel so overwhelmed that football is just full of a bunch of liars, a lot of dishonesty and rich people and poor people and so on. Um, even though that, that may, be, may be the case. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think, apart from this area, I, I don't think the media headlines in the other part of the newspapers necessarily help the mindset of those you're trying to influence, uh, who may well be reading stories uh, in the last few days about the way in which the immigration has contributed to the numbers living in this country and the associated difficulties that fall out from that. And I'm not in any way suggesting that those matters are not ones that we should be discussing. They've got to be because they're, they're very important matters to be discussed. But unless we're doing so in a way that doesn't add to people's natural prejudices, and we're all, we all suffer from prejudice, uh, and we don't want our prejudices to be worked out in a way that's detrimental to other people, then it could be damaging. So I think the press is much more responsible in these matters in how they air them. Uh, but I, I think... How some people receive uh, stories, obviously you can't blame the press for how someone wants to receive it, but we've got to do more as a society to be able to help people to consciously question uh, everything they read to make sure it reflects not just how they feel, but what they see around them. And, and so On there's that, a lot more work to be done. With those wise words, Lord, Lord uh, Herman Oosley, um, Chair of Kick It Out, thank you very much for joining us on Islam Channel. Thank you very much.